I'm pleased to introduce Mike Madronsik, Senior Stakeholder Liaison for the Internal Revenue Service. Mike has been with the IRS since 2002, working in the stakeholder liaison position since 2009, and prior to that as a revenue agent, SBSE exam division in Downers Grove, Illinois. Mike holds degrees in business administration and accounting from Indiana University, an MBA from DePaul University, and is working on completing a Master of Science in Taxation degree, also from DePaul University. We're having a few glitches today, so you won't be able to see Mike on screen, but you will be able to hear him, and he has a great, some great information to share with us today. So I'm going to turn it on over and give Mike the floor. Um, if anybody has any questions, again, please use the Q&A box, and we're going to address those at the end of the presentation. Thank you, Tiffany. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. So, well, thank you everyone for joining us here today. It's really uh, a pleasure to be here and uh, I want to thank everyone for the opportunity to represent the IRS here and provide you with some information that we think will be of great benefit to you. Uh, we are going to be talking about uh, scams that the IRS has seen and also provide some uh, consumer alerts and security tips for uh, securing your data and identity. Uh, so let's get started. And we're gonna go on to the next slide. And uh, as we all know, people these days are using websites for shopping, banking, investing, and identity thieves are shopping for victims. And one of the main things that identity thieves do with stolen names, addresses, and social security numbers is to try to file fake tax returns and claim fraudulent refunds on those returns. So at the IRS, our purpose is twofold. We want to protect taxpayers from identity theft, and we want to protect the taxpayer dollars from fraud and theft. We could go on to the next slide, please. Now, additionally, unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has given cyber criminals opportunities to try to steal information and money. These cyber criminals are relentless. They exploit our hopes and fears about COVID-19 and our need for financial assistance through the economic impact payments that many people have received over the past year and a half or so. If we could go on to the next slide. And what I'd like to do is spend a few minutes. Each year, the IRS publishes a list called the Dirty Dozen a Scam List. And I'd like to go through a few of those from the 2021 list and talk about their impact and uh, how they have uh, uh, are, are something that everyone should be aware of and watch out for. So the first one that we're talking about here on this slide is the economic impact payment theft scam. You need to know that text messages, random incoming phone calls or emails, inquiring about bank account information or requesting recipients to click a link or verify data in regards to economic impact payments should be considered suspicious and deleted without opening. Now these are phishing scams targeting individuals with communications appearing to come from legitimate sources to collect victims' personal and financial data and potentially infect their devices by convincing the target to download malicious uh, programs. Now, you also want to be aware that in addition to the fact that a lot of the economic impact payments were sent to individuals with by direct deposit, Many individuals also receive their economic impact payments via mail, via US uh, Postal Service mail. So we also want you to be alert for mailbox thefts. Frequently check your mail and report suspected mail issues to US Postal System inspectors. We also want you to understand that the IRS won't initiate contact by phone, email, text, or social media asking for social security numbers or other personal or financial information related to economic impact payments. If you're looking for official information, 
go to irs.gov, which is the agency's official website for information on payments, refunds, and other federal tax information. If we could go on to the next slide, please. Now, what you're looking at here came out just yesterday, and it was a uh, uh, something from the uh, consumer. Uh, I'm sorry, the Federal Trade Commission, an alert for consumers, and it's also uh, alerting individuals to the fake IRS email that's been popping up inside people's inboxes. Now, this fake email says that you can get a third economic impact payment if you click a link that lets you access the form for your additional information and get help with the application. But the link is a trick. If you click it, a scammer might steal your money and your personal information to commit identity theft. It's yet another version of the classic government impersonator scam. Now, here are ways to avoid this scam. Know that the government will never call, text, email, or contact you on social media saying that you owe money or to offer help getting a third economic impact payment. Say no to anyone who contacts you claiming to be from a government agency and asking for personal or financial information or for payment in cash, gift cards, wire transfers, or cryptocurrency. Whether they contact you by phone, text, email, or on social media, or show up in person, don't share your social security, Medicare ID, driver's license, bank account, or credit card numbers. And know that the government would never ask you to pay to get financial help. The IRS will not request a fee or the prepayment of taxes to receive a qualifying economic impact payment including the purchase of gift cards. Now you can report government impersonators to reportfraud.ftc.gov. Your reporting does make a difference. If we could go on to the next slide, please. And continuing on with the dirty dozen scam list from the IRS, let's talk about uh, an IRS impersonator phone calls or something that uh, we refer to as phishing. Uh, instead of the phishing, P-H-I-S-I-N-G, when uh, voice-related uh, scams are, uh, uh, are, are attempted, we refer to it as phishing. But the IRS has seen an increase in voice-related phishing, particularly from scams related to federal tax liens. And we'll discuss federal tax lien scams in just a minute. Uh, specifically. Now, recipients of these calls should hang up before giving out any information. If anyone receives an unexpected call from the IRS that they believe to be a scam, they can report it to the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, or the acronym TICTA, and I'll provide you with TICTA's contact information in a few slides. Now the IRS generally first contacts people by mail, not by phone, about unpaid taxes. The IRS may attempt to reach individuals by telephone, but will not insist on payment using an iTunes card, a gift card, prepaid debit card, money order, or wire transfer. And the IRS will never request personal or financial information by email, text, or social media. If we could go on to the next slide, please. In talking about social media, let's talk about social media scams. Now, individuals should know that any of their information that is publicly shared on social media platforms can be collected by identity thieves and used against them. Now, one way to circumvent these scams is to review the social media's privacy settings and limit data that is publicly shared. Now, the basic element of social media scams is convincing a potential victim that he or she is dealing with a person close to them that they trust via email, text, or social media messaging. Now, using personal information, a scammer may email a potential victim and include a link of something of interest to the recipient, but which contains malicious software 
intended to commit more crimes. Scammers also infiltrate the victim's emails and cell phones to go after their friends and family with fake emails that appear to be real and text messages soliciting, for example, donations to fake charities that are appealing to victims. If we could go on to the next slide. And let's talk about a, a fake charity scam. The IRS wants you to be on lookout for scammers who set up fake organizations requesting donations for disaster or tragedy relief. Always, always check out a charity before you make a donation. Do not let the requester pressure you to make a contribution. Now, taxpayers may be able to claim a deduction on their federal tax return for charitable contributions but they must donate to a qualified charity. To check out the status of a charity and its qualifications, use the IRS tax-exempt organization search tool, which you can find on irs.gov. Here are some tips from the IRS to remember about fake charity scams. Ask the fundraiser for the charity's exact name, web address, and mailing address. Some dishonest telemarketers use names that sound like large, well-known charities to confuse people. Now, donors should not work with charities that ask them to pay by giving numbers from a gift card or by wiring money. It's safest to pay by credit card or check after researching the charity. Now, for more information about fake charities, see the information on fake charity scams on the Federal Trade Commission's website. If we could go to the next slide, please. Now let's talk about a scam that's been affecting immigrants and seniors. In this IRS impersonation scam, a taxpayer receives a, typically a telephone call threatening jail time, deportation, or revocation of a driver's license from someone claiming to be from the IRS. Taxpayers who are recent immigrants often are the most vulnerable and should ignore these threats and not engage the scammers. Remember that the first contact with the IRS will usually be through mail, not over the phone. Legitimate IRS employees will not threaten to revoke licenses or have a person deported. These are scare tactics. Let's go on to the next slide. And discuss some of the traits of scam callers. Now, these scam callers may know information about the intended victims, such as digits of a social security number, address, banking information, and they may spoof caller identification information to appear on caller ID as if they're calling from the IRS. They may demand payment via wire transfer or prepaid money cards such as Green Dot, iTunes, MoneyGram, or Western Union. They also may send bogus IRS emails to legitimize the scam, and they may follow up with subsequent calls claiming to be from the police, Department of Motor Vehicles, or the IRS to verify initial debt claims and confirm legal action. If we could go to the next slide, please. Let's talk about another uh, one of the dirty dozen scams, and that's the offer and compromise mills. Now, first, an IRS offer and compromise, or OIC, it's an agreement between a taxpayer and the IRS that resolved the taxpayer's debt with the IRS accepting less than full payment of the debt under certain circumstances. Now, scammer offer and compromise mills mislead people who have no chance of meeting the IRS offer and compromise requirements while charging excessive fees that often amount to thousands of dollars. Promoters claim their services are needed to settle with the IRS, that tax debts can be settled for pennies on the dollar, or that there is a limited window of time to resolve tax debts. Taxpayers should especially be wary of promoters who claim they can obtain larger offer settlements than others, or who may make misleading promises that the IRS will accept an offer 
for a small percentage. Companies advertising on TV or radio frequently cannot do anything for taxpayers that the taxpayers can't do for themselves by contacting the IRS directly. Now, taxpayers can go to irs.gov and, uh, and review the offer and compromise pre-qualifier tool to see if they qualify for an offer and compromise. If we could go to the next slide, please. And let's talk about unscrupulous tax return preparers. Now, by law, anyone who is paid to prepare or assist in preparing federal tax return must have a valid preparer tax identification number, a PTIN. They have to sign the tax return and they have to include the PTIN on that return. Now, unscrupulous tax return preparers may also require payment in cash only and not provide a receipt. They will invent income that they will put on the return to qualify their clients for tax credits. They will claim fake tax deductions to boost the size of the refund. And they may direct refunds into their own bank account rather than the taxpayer's account. You've got to choose your tax return preparer wisely. And the IRS provides a choosing a tax professional page on irs.gov that has information about tax preparer credentials and qualifications. And it also provides a directory of federal tax return preparers with credentials and select qualifications to help you identify the preparers by type of credential and qualification. That's also available through irs.gov. The IRS wants you to understand and remember that every taxpayer is responsible legally for what is on their tax return, even if it is prepared by someone else. If we could go on to the next slide, please. A few more scams to go through. Um, there was a lottery scam that the IRS has seen. And here the victims were told that they had won the lottery but they had to send payment for taxes and other fees before receiving winnings. If we could go to the next slide. A couple of other impersonation scams. Um, scammers using false IRS websites, a hyperlink on a spam email and phishing. As you can see down there at the bottom of the screen, the link that they provided in this fake email uh, is it goes to a malicious code on a hacked website. You got to be careful and read the emails that you receive very carefully. If we could go to the next slide, and here's another example. In this uh, example, this in this slide, it's a violation of the law as it is a misuse of, of U.S. Treasury names and symbols. It is unlawful to use even the words Department of Treasury uh, any of, of their bureau offices or title of an officer, such as the Secretary of Treasury, to impersonate any employee of the Treasury in part of any type of schemes such as this. It's extremely important because of the easy prolifer proliferation of email that you pay careful attention to who is sending you emails and what the actual reply to address is on the email. In this example, as you can see, it looks like it comes from IRS. It uses a treasury symbol, but you are replying to someone else. So it's critically important to pay attention to that sort of thing. Look at that reply to line. You can see it's not going to the IRS. If we could go on to the next slide, please. So what if you get a suspicious IRS email what do you do? Well, you send it to the IRS and you send it to this email address, which is phishing at irs.gov. If you go to irs.gov and use the search term phishing in the search box, it'll bring you to, uh, to a site that will tell you about the phishing at irs.gov uh, procedure. So step one is it identifies on the screen don't respond to those emails and forward the email to the phishing at irs.gov. Delete that email from your computer. 
and then do not reply or open any attachments in the email because they could be malicious. If we could go to the next slide, a few more examples of phishing attempts that the IRS has seen. Here's an example of an SMS or a sort message service text message impersonating the IRS. The subject is you are eligible and the message is register for COVID-19 stimulus help. The SMS included a link, but the link does not take you to the IRS, but it does take you to a phishing site where if you do enter sensitive information, your personal financial information would be stolen by thieves. If we could go to the next slide, please. Here's another example of a phishing text message. Note the language. It says, you have a pending claim of $1,200 from COVID-19 relief, and that further action is required to disperse the funds. And continue here to, to confirm the payment method. Here it uses a shortened URL to misdirect you to a scam site. Now a shortened URL allows a fisher to fit an otherwise long URL in an SMS message. More importantly, a shortened URL mask the actual website since it, the shortened URL looks nothing like the final phishing website URL. If we could go to the next slide, please. And here's uh, another example of a phishing text posing as a fictitious government agency in New York. It uses similar language, which is, you've received a direct deposit of $1,200 from COVID-19 treasury funds. Further action is required to accept this payment. Again, the link directs you to a scam site. It asks you to enter sensitive information and any entered information is sent directly to thieves. So let's go on to the next slide. And here are some basic steps to protect your data online. If you're, if you're shopping, look for the HTTPS and a padlock icon at each website you visit. The S in the HTTPS is for secure communications over a computer network. And don't shop on unsecured public Wi-Fi in places like a mall or coffee shop. Remember, thieves can eavesdrop. So another fundamental step to data security is the installation and use of security software on your computers. Uh, just uh, looking at uh, some of the items here on your slide, Antivirus software, it prevents bad software such as malware from causing damage to a computer. Anti-spyware, it prevents unauthorized software from stealing information that is on a computer or processed through a uh, system. A firewall blocks unwanted connections. And please don't forget to secure your mobile phone as well. It's an area that sometimes people overlook and uh, scammers are becoming more adept at com compromising mobile phones. Now, taxpayers can check out security recommendations for the specific mobile phone by reviewing the Federal Communication Commission's smartphone security checker. And you can find that at FCC.gov. And if you're looking for good security software, we suggest a few websites such as PC Magazine, CNET, or Wirecutter, which is part of the New York Times and they can provide a good place to do your research. If we can go on to the next slide. The IRS also strongly encourages you to use passwords, strong passwords that are critical for protecting your online accounts. So you should use strong and unique passwords for each account. And the latest guidance from experts suggests that a pass, that a phrase or a series of words can be easily remembered, should be used, and should be 10 characters or longer. If we could go on to the next slide. So, so far we've talked about the IRS impersonation scams that use phone, email, text that are impersonating IRS uh, employees. The IRS wants you to understand and remember that the IRS does not call demanding payment and making threats of jail or lawsuits. It won't demand payment via gift, debit, or iTunes cards. The IRS is not gonna send unsolicited emails about refunds. The IRS is not gonna request login credentials, social security numbers, or other sensitive information. And for more information, you can go to irs.gov 
slash fishing. If we could go to the next slide, please. I mentioned earlier that uh, there is an organization within the IRS, or actually the US Treasury Department, called the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, or TIGDA, and it does investigate IRS impersonation scams. And here's the contact information for TIGDA. And we did mention a couple of times, uh, you can get additional information through the Federal Trade Commission. And there is the FTC's website. If we could go on to the next slide. Now the federal government does have a uh, government bureau that helps, has uh, some password guidance. And that is the National Institute of Standards and Technology or NIST. Um, we're all familiar with passwords at this point in time, but just what makes a strong password and the NIST, their standards and guidance can help you. Uh, it's suggested that people use passphrases, not passwords. And the NIST's guidance is to create passphrases that are easy to remember instead of creating passwords that are gibberish, you know, the random numbers, letters, and characters. You could, you could go to the uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology website and get more information. Now, password managers, let's talk about that for just a second. Uh, at this point, I think all of us have online accounts. So if we're creating very long passphrases for each of our online accounts, we're gonna have a lot of stuff to remember. And that's where a password manager comes in. Now, the Department of Homeland Security calls password managers the most secure way to store all of your unique passwords. With a password manager, you have only one master password for the manager itself, and it can generate and retrieve passwords for every account that you have. Again, we suggest you can go to media outlets like PC Magazine, CNET, or Wirecutter, and they review and rank password manager applications. If we go on to the next slide, coming here to the end. Now, in regards to the tax returns that you file with the IRS, the IRS has an identity protection PIN program that is available to any taxpayer now. It's a six digit number. Uh, it's assigned to taxpayers and it helps the IRS verify a taxpayer's identity. And it prevents someone else from filing a tax return with your social security number. At this point, any taxpayer can get an IP PIN. We can go on to the next slide. And here's a little bit on the screen, a, a little bit of the history of the uh, Identity Protection PIN program. You can see it started in 2011, but beginning in January of 2021, all taxpayers can apply for an IP PIN and you can get more information and uh, get that IP pin at irs.gov slash IP pin. So with that, I wanna thank you very much for your time and attention. And what I'm going to do now is uh, what I, if you have uh, any questions that we can't answer during uh, today's presentation, I will provide my email address in the uh, text chat and I'll do that in just a minute. But for right now, I'm gonna turn it back over to Tiffany.